everybody. It's Jane Johnston with the Briar Hill Group at Remax Closen, co-host of He Said, She Said, They Said, a real discussion in real estate with Andrew Plank. Andrew is not here today. Uh, with me today is going to be my guest, Anthony McLaughlin. We're going to be talking about mortgages and answer a few key questions that you need to learn about when you're getting ready to finance or maybe even sell, getting qualified before you sell. But before we get to that, first, we're just going to talk about what's happening in the market. So uh, we have 196 new listings with 218 pendings. This is probably the first time in a long time that our list to sale ratio has gone uh, over 100%. I think the last time was in March. And we've had a price decrease of 40. We've had a price increase of two. And 249 listings have sold so far in the past week. Now, uh, or sorry, this month, um, a lot of sales will be happening this week just because a lot of people want to move the last week of August, kind of end out the summer where they are, and then move starting new in September. So I expect that number to be huge at the end of the week. Uh, year to date, we have 566 unconditional sales for August 2021. That's compared to 979, and that was record-breaking last year for August. We have 659 new listings, and that's compared to 1,333 last year in August 2020. So we are down. So now is a great time to sell if you want to. Um, you're almost guaranteed to get it sold if you list it well. And in terms of total active listings, we are still low at 1,249, and that's compared to 200, uh, 2,584. And I just realized I forgot to share the screen with you, but that's okay. We have the data. <laughs> Let's get to the meat of the presentation, and that is Anthony McLaughlin. Welcome. Thank you, Jane. <laughs> that's what I get for doing it by myself. <laughs> 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 so um first of all tell us a bit about yourself so um what company do you work for so well? i work for uh, mortgage architects um and i uh, moved to the island uh, a little over a year ago now it's been uh, fantastic out here uh, getting acclimatized to the uh the island lifestyle and uh yeah i've been a mortgage broker for a couple years now and uh yeah loving it what do you find is the biggest challenge with people um, buying now, with being uh, first-time buyers, or um, what's the one thing that they need to focus on before they come to you? Uh, well, I think one thing that pe folks need to focus on is, uh, well, I think the first thing you should do is when they're thinking about buying is go to a, a mortgage professional <laughs> because uh, there's a lot of unanswered questions that you can uh get out of the way ahead of time and it could be things in terms of i mean basic question of how much do i qualify for but i mean you can also from there if you start the process early enough you can change your financial situation well ahead of making a purchase let's say you're like okay we want to be homeowners in three months that's fantastic but if you've uh if you're being priced out of the market if you've got some debts on the side that maybe you need to consolidate or just wipe out entirely, it's good to know that ahead of time so that a, you can buy what you want to buy and you're not stretched too thin once you get into your home and you can be happy. So there's, there's a lot of things to consider. Um, and yeah, I, I think just starting the process as early as possible and uh, work, working with a, a trusted reputable mortgage broker is uh, the best way to do that. Yeah, I just want to remind people, if you have a question, you can ask Anthony. Um, we did get a like on one of your comments there. And I just want to say that it's so true that if you start with a plan in place, like, for instance, you don't uh, plan your retirement at uh, age 60, you mm -hmm. should start with planning your, planning your retirement at age 20 so that uh, you're in touch with the right people to help you make the right decisions to get the, the whole picture ready for when you are ready, right? Exactly. Yeah. And there's, uh, there's nothing that's more, more sad than when I get a, a, a pair of first time home buyers and they're so excited to get in the marketplace and they realize that they've got a lot of other things they need to consider before they're going to get there. And when it's you're the largest investment you may be making in your life, uh, in your late twenties, early thirties, whenever you, you decide to buy, 
it's, yeah, it's good to know where you, where you stand uh, well ahead of time. Okay. So I'm just wondering, a lot of people use mortgage calculators online. And so they kind of, uh, to me, they're a lead generation tool that pre-screens people. They put in their confidential information. They stick it out into the ether. Uh, what are those good for? Should people be using them or, or what? I, I think they are a great tool um, because usually there there is some uh, some good information there and it'll, things like what's the difference between a fixed and variable? What are the things you need to consider? What are my total monthly costs going to look like? Because it's not just the mortgage, right? You have to take in consideration, are you paying strata fees? Um, are you, what do my property taxes look like? Things like of that nature, right? And um, so, yeah, they're, they're good in that, in that sense that it, it does, it's nice to have some clients come forward who are uh, a little bit educated on what the process or things that they need to consider look like. But at the same time, they are lead generation tools. And when you punch in your, your information and it says you can afford this, I would take that with a very small grain of salt because those tools aren't checking your credit history. It doesn't know how much debt you're already servicing. And ultimately, it's going to be potentially very, very inaccurate. And if you go in and say, oh, yeah, I think I'm pre-qualified and put down a deposit to purchase a home and then you don't qualify for that mortgage you thought you could, then things get very messy for you. So it's it's best to uh, have a full diagnostic of your financial situation so that you uh, you know full well that when you put in an offer and give up a nice chunk of change on your deposit, uh, you're going to be secure and you know that you're going to close. Okay, so I agree. So I used to say it's kind of like taking a kid to a candy store. They want to know how much money they have in their pocket before they before you let them look at the candy so that they don't ask for too much. And otherwise you don't want to go through the emotional roller coaster ride. But um, often too, when somebody writes an offer, we have seven to 10 days and those are real days. So like five to seven business days to really get the financing in order. So they have to have everything ready before they come to us. And usually what I do is um, I introduce them to the broker. So someone like you or my friend, Jen Lowe, and uh, who is going to qualify them so that when we go into the offer, they have the minimum amount of documents that they need to provide. So often, uh, like I would say, meet with your mortgage broker early on so that you get your picture ready and start collecting a file folder, I say of, um, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I have a Dropbox folder with all of my notices of assessment. Mm -hmm. I have uh, pay stubs in there. I have my mortgage documents in there and um, like for the house that I own and then other documentation about debt. Is that a good idea? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, if you put in an offer, sometimes I'll, I'll speak to a client, we'll get fully underwritten. And uh, then we'll be, maybe be missing a few documents. If you put in an offer, but you have a condition on financing, but we need documents, maybe a job, maybe we're missing a job letter and your company decides that, oh, it's going to take them you four, them four days to issue it. Well, that's four out of our seven business days gone to be able to waive our condition on financing because we need to get that document sent over to the lender and approved. They got to finish their underwriting and send us our um, our commitment or a conditional commitment. Um, so yeah, definitely make sure that you have all your documents up front ready to go so that when the purchase happens and you just want to make sure that you have no trouble getting financing and you have that condition in, we can ship it all off and five to seven business days is plenty of time to get a commitment back from a lender. So things like if you have a separation from your spouse to have a separation agreement? A hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, folks, I've, I've had to request that m multiple times now. And uh, I mean, it's, obviously it's it's a sensitive issue. And uh, But you have to understand from the lender's perspective, if they're going to be loaning you, call it $600,000, they have a right to know how much of your annual income maybe is going to be directed to your, your former spouse. So these are things that really need to be considered ahead of time. And even something as simple as uh, what type of income do you earn? Are you T Ford straight up salary? 
or do we need to see your T1 generals because you draw dividends to pay yourself? I mean, there's things like all that's going to show up on your full T1 and we're going to see your in rental property income. And then we need the mortgage statements and uh, the tax, um, the property tax statements from that property too. So being as clear as possible up front so that your mortgage professional knows what the whole picture looks like, not just a, a little snapshot of it is uh, going to save you a lot of stress and uh, a lot of time down the road. Okay. So say I have a client who's interested in buying a home and uh, their first time buyer or they, or maybe it's uh, somebody who hasn't been a first time buyer before with a first time buyer. What are the steps to qualification? I say, here, Joe, meet Anthony. Anthony, take it away. So every mortgage broker, mortgage professional will have their own process. But for me, what I like to do is uh, once I, I get that notification that, hey, here's here's Anthony, I like to hop on the phone with the clients as quickly as possible um, just to have a quick discovery call. And all we're doing is getting to know each, one another and kind of doing a, a light dive into your financial situation, where you are in the process and what your expectations are. Um, and then from there, I send over an application and a list of documents that I require. So through that phone call, all I've already figured out, are you T4 at income or are you self-employed? So I know kind of what we're looking at in terms of the documents that we need. Um, and then I'll also ask you, do you own other, any other properties, things like that? Um, yeah. And then so once we have the, our list of documents and our application, which really these things don't take too, too long to uh, put together. Um, then I take a day, maybe two, put all those uh, together in our online application software, um, which allows me to submit directly to the lender. And then I like to do a more in-depth um, call, which is I like to call my, my strategy session and do a screen share and help folks understand what it all means. What are my GDS and TDS ratios? Um, how does this all fit into my mortgage payment? Um, really go through the entire mortgage process step by step so that the client is as informed as they can be on one of the largest investments they'll make in their life. Because I, I, I personally, I like to have my clients be savvy and knowledgeable about their mortgage because it's just going to serve them better um, five, 10 years down the road. If you get set up with a a mortgage really quickly and you don't know how it works, it's not going to serve you if your plans change in three years. So it's best to kind of have a plan and, uh, and yeah, go over things in, in solid detail. Okay. So you use a bit of terminology there, GDS and TDS. Do you want to show us, you were going to uh, screen share. Are you yes. able to do that? Yes, absolutely. Let's uh, pull this up. Screen share. Mm -hmm. And I always say that uh, sometimes there are people who don't have credit. So that's one reason to talk to a mortgage broker is because um, you want to start establishing your credit by getting a credit card and paying it off. So um, I actually had a client who went down to the States for two years and didn't use her credit card and so lost her credit rating. It was zero. <laughs> oh, no. So, um, and then there are certain things that you can do when you are establishing your credit. So if you're, um, you got a, a credit card of uh, $2,500, just put a couple hundred dollars on it every month, pay it, pay it off and make sure you don't go over like 50% because they do look at how much you have in relation to your total debt. Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Can you see that? I, I did the screen share and it should have come up. No, let me just, no, I can't. I did not see it. Um, Try that again. Do you want to send it to me? The, uh, well, it, it's live on, uh, on my Phylogix, uh, our software that we use. So it's going to show yeah. you that uh, Safari share uh, Chrome launch it. Oh, it doesn't seem to want to but I, I can go over those uh, in, in detail enough to really break okay. down 
what, what we're looking at. So what I'm looking at over here is I've put together a file of uh, Jane and John Doe, a young couple looking to make their first purchase. And uh, those uh, uh, mortgage terms that I use, the GDS and TDS. So what the GDS is, that's your gross debt servicing ratio. Sounds very confusing. It's not that confusing. Um, what that is taking into account is the principal and the interest of your mortgage. That makes up your entire mortgage payment. And that also takes into account your taxes and the heating. So that's annualized and then broken down into 12 months because that's what we're trying to figure out how much of your annual income is being serviced to pay this new mortgage debt, right? And all those things that go into it. Again, the principal, the interest, the taxes, and the heating. So what lenders like to see with the GDS is that it's not above 39% of your annual income. And that's really important because 39% is pretty much the max. So we like to land a little bit below that. Um, TDS, your total debt servicing ratio, that takes into account all other debts that you have, where if you were to stop making payments, you would continue to incur interest. So that's any credit cards, lines of credit, um, auto loans. Um, things like uh, phone bills, we just kind of remove from our liability section from our, our application because lenders aren't interested in your $100 a month that you owe to Bell. Um, <laughs> so that and that the max of that is that they don't want to see that above 44%. So really, obviously, they don't want to see your over 50% of your income going towards servicing the new home that you're going to be having, right? So uh, in this scenario that I drew up, both of our, our clients had uh, 65K annual salary. Um, I think I've made John, John's a drywaller and uh, Jane's an accountant. So, <laughs> and uh, so we had a couple different uh, things that I added here. I added a few items to their um, liability section, just hypothetical credit card debts and auto loans. And that landed our, our GDS and TDS at 38% and 42. So definitely within the guidelines. And if you, the good thing to know that is if you are applying for a mortgage and maybe you're just like, we're talking fractions of percentages over these guidelines, if you have strong credit, lenders will make an allowance for that and still give you an approval. Because if you have the ability to pay off your credit on time um, and you don't have any delinquencies on your credit bureaus, then they see that, okay, you're responsible with your money. So they're willing to make those allowances. Okay. So I have a question. Uh, the credit rating is a score out of? 900. And what's a good credit rating? So a good credit rating would be anywhere between 700 and 900. Um, it's kind of, uh, they're all good. I mean, once you get down into the 650 range, that's when we start getting questions from the lenders. Um, if you're between 650 and seven, they may ask a question like, oh, what? why is the credit rating so low? But usually it's a whole blueprint, your credit bureau report of, okay, maybe you only ever had one credit card on your file and you haven't built up a strong portfolio of uh, credit, which is funny because I mean, that's just the world we live in. You uh, get better credit by having more lines on your, <laughs> on your credit bureau. So we are in a world where uh, the more credit that you service and pay on time, the better your report's going to be. And I have I have seen a 900 before. It's very rare, but they, they exist out there. <laughs> also, um, uh, I'm just thinking, there can be times when you've had credit or you've like owned a car or whatever, and you've had a loan and you've paid it off. And so these things come up. This is why you want to get this all checked ahead of time because these things come mm -hmm. up in your credit bureau and um, they show as not being paid off. Mm -hmm. So- often you have to get those cleared as well before your mortgage goes through, right? Absolutely. I, I've, I've had to do that several, a couple times with some clients. And uh, it, honestly, getting in, uh, in contact with Equifax to say, hey, why is this trade line here? They pick up the phone really quickly. Um, and it's usually a relatively simple process being, no, I've, that's been cleared out. I don't know why that says that. Sometimes people will say, well, there's a collection agency after me. Um, and those things can be mistakes, or maybe it's just something that happened and you forgot about it 10 years ago. And, uh, there's a $27 balance that has to be paid off and dealt with before, um, a lender is going to, uh, cough up all their money. So 
yeah, it's it, again, it's good to get that out of the way. Sometimes I'll have clients worried about what their credit looks like because maybe they've had some inquiries uh, or a couple of inquiries in the past year and they'll say, oh, I don't want to pull my credit yet. That's hard for me as a professional to say, oh, okay, well, where do you think the credit score is at? Like they, they say they don't want me to pull it, but I can't do my job and confidently say you can afford this if I can't get a good look at how things are and what other debts you're servicing. Because sometimes folks will think that those personal loans don't count towards their credit score or those lines of credit and it's just credit cards. So it's, uh, it's very difficult to give people an accurate uh, response when they don't want to share all the details up front. Yeah. And I found that in the past also with other clients who've been like not fully forthcoming and uh, they've gotten irritated with the broker because with like somebody in your position, because you're mm-hmm. asking the question, you're like, I'm asking the question because we need the full picture. We need the full mm-hmm. picture because the bank wants to know who they're financing, right? What's the. Exactly. Yeah. And honestly, if you think about it, me asking them up front and saying, Hey, we need to get rid of this potentially like stress point for us because down the road, when the lender finds out, and they always find out <laughs> there it's going to be the delay of the back and forth closings coming up. Lawyers need to be instructed two weeks before closing. And if we're inching closer and closer to that deadline, the client's stress is going to be so much higher. So trust your professional uh, mortgage broker that uh, you're passing off these documents to that they're, they are, we're obviously acting in your best interests because we want a smooth process for you. We want to be able to service you the best we can. And so we're not just uh, asking for documents and this and that because it's it's fun. And we're, we're just trying to guide you through the process to make it as uh, stress-free as possible. Okay, so what's the timeline here? They meet with you. They have their discovery call. Mm-hmm. Then you tell them what documentation you need. Then you do your strategy call. Then usually they call me. They mm-hmm. tell me what their budget is. There's to me, there are two budgets. There's a budget you're approved for, and there's a budget you want to spend. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And then they write an offer with me. Then they have seven to 10 days. I send a copy of the um, offer and the MLS documents and form B, if it's a strata Mm -hmm. to you. And then uh, how many days do you need? What Um, what do you need now? Pardon me? What do you need now? Because I know that that can change. So assuming that we have all of our documentation and uh, the only new documents that we may need is if that uh, we've been speaking for over a month or two, then we may need new job letters and new pay stubs because they have uh, job letters and pay stubs have to be dated no longer than 30 days of the application submission. So we may need new job letters and, uh, and pay stubs. So it's good to, if you think that you're seeing a place and you're going to put in an offer, make sure you tell your HR or your supervisor, hey, um, we're going to act on a property. Maybe issue us a, a letter just in case, right? It, it's a, They have them templated and they drop in your information. Shouldn't take too much time whatsoever. Um, then from there, uh, in slower uh, times in the market, we can have commitments back the same day. Um, in really busy times, um, especially throughout COVID because the lines are jammed with folks trying to uh, deal with deferred mortgage payments and things of that nature. Um, It can take a a few more days, but uh, within five to seven business days is definitely a generous amount of time. Um, Usually you can get it done in three. Okay. I'm not telling my clients that. (laughs) All right. I I say three, I meant six. I meant six. (laughs) I'm just kidding. I, I just, I always figure just get them a little extra time because uh, first mm-hmm. of all, it depends on the lender and who you're submitting it to and who the underwriter is and all that stuff. Okay. So the question, buying a house with or without a suite, good or bad? Uh, it depends. Um, I have some folks reach out that uh, they don't, they simply don't qualify for a traditional mortgage. And they say, well, let's, uh, why don't we, find a place that has a basement suite and that'll help us qualify. Not really how that's going to work because if you don't already qualify using a hundred percent of that rental income, isn't going to get you below that bar. You'll just be writing off the debt that you can't already afford. 
to kind of put, put it bluntly. <laughs> so it's fantastic for folks who already qualify, who want to be able to write off their mortgage expenses by having a tenant in there, or at least a portion of them to have uh, the tenant um, chip in that way. But uh, yeah, it's there is a misconception that um, having a rental suite um, with your investment will make you qualify where more often than not, I have folks who don't qualify um, asking me for that. And I mean, there's all, also alternative lending, but um, that's another a whole other <laughs> conversation. <laughs> also, like um, I always say to somebody, first of all, you have to have the mentality to be a landlord because you, mm -hmm. if you get a bad tenant, oh my God, it's the worst thing ever. Absolutely. Um, and you can literally ruin your house by having a, the bad tenant. So mm -hmm. you have to be a sort of a strong mindset to to have tenants okay and then the other thing is um that i think you should be able to afford your house without the suite the suite is just the bonus right mm -hmm. absolutely yes okay um what about conventional mortgages versus unconventional so conventional when we it's funny whenever um <laughs> we have to fill out a form when people sell and they, we go like, uh, we're supposed to say, where are they from? And uh, are they financing through conventional or unconventional? So conventional is more than 20% down. But I would say now a conventional is probably under 20%. Like yeah. how many people actually have over 20% down? Um, that's a good question. I'd, 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 I'd want to look at my statistics and see where my uh, all my, my past clients kind of land. But uh, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, especially uh, folks trying to get into the market and uh, being priced out, people want to act as quickly as possible. And maybe they haven't uh, built up enough uh, of a down payment to avoid that uh, default insurance that's attached to those, uh, those high ratio mortgages, right? So, I mean, the difference really, there's kind of three blocks of mortgages. You have your um, insured mortgages. So you're putting down less than 20% and your, the mortgage is going to be insured. And the important thing to know about that is that that insurance is called mortgage default insurance. That's paid by the borrower, but it protects the bank in case you default on your mortgage. So that's kind of the risk that they're taking they're saying, okay, yeah, you can put down 5% for this $500,000 property, but you're also going to pay our insurance to make sure that if things go sideways, at least we get our investment back. So that's, yeah. that's the trade-off there. And then you have your conven conventional where you're putting down uh, at least 20%. And Uncon oh, yeah. Um, conventional, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have your conventional where you're putting down 20%, but it's under a million dollars. So that's um, that's probably where most – insured and conventional is where most folks land. And then, uh, then you have your uninsurable. And really what that means is that you're purchasing a home over a million dollars. So conventional runs all the way up to 999999. <laughs> so one penny more and you're looking at an uninsurable mortgage. And the main difference with that is that uh, you it's um pardon me, the main difference with that is that it it's over a million dollars and your interest rate is going to be slightly higher. There's a bit of a premium for that. Um, so I get folks who are like, Oh, I'm looking at this uh, property for 1.7. Um, I got my 20% down. We're good to go. Fantastic. But you need to consider that just because it, uh, you're putting down 20, you have to put down 20% for, um, for a property over a million. But one thing most folks don't know is that there is a sliding scale with how much over a million you're going to go. Uh, at 1.5, they may ask for an additional 5% down. At, it, it's very different from lender to lender. So we can kind of go to the one that fits your, your budget or how much you have available. But uh, definitely something to consider that it's not just 20% down for a $5 million home. That that's going to be a very different down payment and something you need to consider up front. Right. And so um, that's often why people list properties at nine ninety nine because they get people who are getting conventional mortgages mm -hmm. wanting to purchase it, and then they get people who can afford more who can go the unconventional route. Exactly. <clears throat> okay. Why is down payment verification so important? So this one gets tricky, and is something that I've made sure that I uh, I have very open conversation with. Uh, 
my clients up front about where their money is coming from. If uh, some folks like to move their money around so much ahead of uh, ahead of closing, they're, it's in an R- RRSP. They withdraw it with their first time uh, benefit and they pop it into a TFSA to, uh, to let it gain some interest for a few months. And then they throw it in their checking. Then they throw it in their pe- spouse's savings account and money's just going all over the place. We, what we need is 90 days banking statements from every account that money has touched. So if it's been moving around a whole bunch, if it's a gift, we need to know where the money's coming from. And simply that's due to the Anti-Money Laundering Act, Um, especially since uh, the housing crisis in the States and then through COVID, um, people have become uh, very savvy in finding ways to kind of get around the rules. And lenders are getting extremely strict with knowing exactly where your funds are coming from. So it's good to, I mean, don't move it around as much. <laughs> if you want to leave it in a TFSA so it can uh, gain some interest, fantastic. But don't have your money hopping all over the place because if I have to send you out to go get bank statements from your wherever your TFSA is being held, from your RSP, from three different checking accounts, you're going to get incredibly frustrated. And this is typically the uh, most um, time-consuming part Once you have your mortgage commitment, we still have a list of conditions we need to fulfill. Number one is going to be down payment verification. Um, It's easily the most important to the lender to make sure that the money is, for lack of a better word, clean. And you need need a gift letter just in case as well. Yes. Yeah. And obviously you need a gift letter from your donor. And um, if the money is already in your account from, from your parents or your direct family member, that's fine. But if... Once you've got your commitment, then the money transfers over. The bank has the right to ask for your parents' uh, 90 days banking history so they can confirm that it did, in fact, come from them. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. That is a little twist. Yes. And and obviously, then that's a whole other conversation. And the parents are wondering, why do I have to cough up my private banking details? That's the price of doing business and getting a a nice big loan to own a home. Yeah. Just keep it simple. The other thing, people have an agreement with um, your parents regarding that gift letter. So make sure the, it's very clear if you do or do not have to return that money, the bank has to see that. Yes. Banks will not allow uh, allow gifts um, with the side conversation that, oh, it's, we are going to pay it back. It's just a temporary loan because then that's, again, something that needs to go in your liabilities. It's like if you had a, um, a, ba- a, a personal line of credit and you use that down payment, uh, that money for your down payment to buy the home. That's obviously got to come out and we have to account for that in your debt servicing ratios. Yeah, you could give them a percentage of the house too. That could yeah. be. Yeah. Put them on the title and give them uh, 10%. Okay, so what if people don't qualify? So I have a friend who lives in the Maritimes. She and her husband actually are alternative lender, lenders. Hmm. So what does that mean? So the alternative lending scene is uh, has been getting has just been growing exponentially. There are so many different lending solutions for folks who don't meet those uh, those debt servicing guidelines of thirty nine percent and forty four percent. And these alternative lending solutions are still fantastic and they can go up to 65% of your annual income so that you can get a home. And the thing is, obviously folks, they want to see the lowest possible interest rate for their mortgage because that's a nice uh, nice piece of uh, bragging conversation when you're having a barbecue at your friend's place. But uh, these rates, they start at about three and a half percent and then go up from there. Two years ago, the going rate was about 3.9% for for a fixed mortgage. So um, if you're desperate to get into the market, hesitant about going with alternative lending, I would kind of take a step back and reassess because when you're looking at today's rates, we call it 1.7 for conventional, maybe that's probably a little bit high. Um, to three, three and a half percent, maybe a little bit higher. It's all pretty relative. And the opportunity to get into a home 
and start building equity is so much more important than the bragging rights of having um, a slightly lower uh, interest rate tied to your mortgage. So the, this, there's a lot of different lending opportunities out there for people with, I mean, all the different various types of financial situations that I've seen from folks. Um, some of them say, oh, no, we're not quite there yet. But you can move into these uh, these programs. And with some lenders, they have graduation programs. So let's say you go with First National. They have a graduation program that you'll be on their Alt, Alt, Alt A side. And then in a year or two, without refinancing, you can requalify for that mortgage with your uh, rebuilt up um, file and graduate yourself into their A program. So there's a lot of great opportunities out there. And uh, yeah, people should be looking. I, I think people just have to be really careful because um, if you have like a primary and secondary lenders, sometimes somebody can pull um, pull the loan in. Um, I don't, and depending on the terms. And so they can actually hoop you. Um, and I've had that happen with a client where they went with a sketchy really? lender. So you really want to go with somebody who's professionally recommended, not, mm -hmm. a, not a private individual who may decide to call the loan on you and then repossess your home. No, absolutely. Yeah. It, not all lenders are created equal. Uh, when you get to that B, uh, Alt A private side, you're not looking at, you're looking at far less regulations. And so it is important to really understand who that lender is. Um, you should have a lot more questions as a buyer, if you, that's the direction you're going and uh, really look into that lender and make sure that they're a right fit and then they've got a good track record. Okay, awesome. Okay, well, thanks so much for giving us so much to talk about today. Oh my God, it was like, I love it. Sensory overload, yeah. There's there's just so much that goes into a mortgage. And uh, I mean, that's what I love about this industry is that it's, especially over the last couple a year and a half or so, it's, I mean, it's constantly changing, lender policy is constantly changing. So um, having a, a constant open dialogue, if you're looking to buy um, with your mortgage broker is, uh, is incredibly important because things are constantly changing. Okay, so how do people get in touch with you, Anthony? So uh, you can find me at uh, ratedesk.ca. That's our uh, company website or uh, Mortgage Architects. And uh, you can email me at anthony at ratedesk.ca or reach me at 250-686-0383. Awesome. And um, if you want to reach me, if you're interested in getting uh, an update on what's happening with the market, you can call me. My name is Jane Johnston. I'm with the Briar Hill Group. You can reach me at 250-744-0775. My email is briarhillgroup at gmail.com. And I have two websites. One's on neighborhoods called uh, vancouverislandtime.com, where we interview local entrepreneurs about where they live and their business. And my other one is briarhillgroup.com where we interview people about uh, real estate. All right. Thanks so much for joining us today. It really was very informative and um, you're a great speaker. So appreciate you coming on. Well, thanks for having me, Jane. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye. Yeah.